Great. We've got a lot of folks getting on with us this morning. So that is great. Uh, it is a little after 7.30, 7.31. So we're going to go ahead and get started. First of all, I'd like to thank you for joining us this morning um, for this webinar on social determinants of health. Um, we want to remind you that if you stay on today's call with us, you are giving us your permission to be recorded and this, web, this recording will be posted to um, the website. All right, well, I know it's early and so grab your coffee because this is gonna be a fantastic webinar. We are so excited to have Angie Walker with us this morning. Um, Angie is from DeQueen and manages the Dr. Randy Walker Family Practice an Allergy Clinic in DeQueen. Um, their clinic consists of an exceptional team of physicians, nurse practitioners, and staff members who are all dedicated to providing the best primary care medical services possible. Their office is well known throughout Arkansas for providing whole person care including understanding patients' values, assessing social needs and other barriers to care, and helping patients achieve what they want out of life without being sidelined by illness. And with that, we'll turn it over to Angie Walker to talk to us about social determinants of health this morning. Good morning, guys. Um, I'm going to apologize real quick. I'm actually in Little Rock at the, um, we're starting the Excel by 8 conference this morning at 10 o'clock. So what you're seeing behind me is my motel room. <laughs> so I'm hoping you can hear me. I don't have my office microphone. So if you can't, um, just interrupt me. If you have questions, interrupt me. Um, I try to be as informal as possible when talking about our practice and the things that we do. I try to make sure I tell you the things that, um, we did bad as, the, as well as the things that we did good. That way I, I learned better from um, things that didn't work. Or if I'm starting this journey, I do want to know the things that don't work. That way um, I'm not wasting and spinning my wheels for nothing. So um, just kind of a little quick precursor. Um, what I'm speaking on today is social determinants of health. And for some of you, um, or maybe all of you, you're in value-based programs. And so um, social determinants of health affect those programs. Um, they affect healthcare. I was reading a study yesterday that said 82 or 87% of healthcare happens outside of the doctor's office. And that was I, that really made me think about that. You know, you really think that within that 15 to 30 minutes that you see that patient, you're you're having a lot of impact on that patient. But what you don't realize is that patient walks out of that office. Um, they walk into their neighborhood or they walk into their home or their employer or what have you. And so a lot of things, most things are affected outside of that office visit. So I want to give you a little bit of background information on our clinic so you can determine if we're close to being the same, you know, if we have about the same practice, the same size or the same demographics. And I'm hoping that helps as well. Um, and I'm going to have Justin advance my slides. If, so you'll hear me, hear me say, OK, please turn the slide. So, Justin, if you could turn the slide. So um, just a little bit about our clinic demographics. We have two board certified medical physicians, um, Dr. Walker and Dr. Glasgow. Dr. Walker's board certified in family practice. Dr. Glasgow's board certified in family practice and also emergency medicine. We have eight advanced nurse practitioners, a psychiatric nurse practitioner, and a dietitian. We currently have three locations. Mostly what you're going to hear me talk about is going to be, well, you're going to actually hear me talk about all three of them because I think they're all extremely impactful. So our main clinic, which is located in DeQueen, is open seven days a week. We are open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Sunday. We also have a school-based clinic on the DeQueen District um, campus, and we service all five, you know, uh, 
primary, elementary, middle school, junior high, and high school. Um, it's going to be open Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. It really is limited to during the school year. We get there about a week before school starts up, and then we're there about a week after school lets out. Um, we recently opened, and I say recently, it's we just celebrated a year there. In March of 2021, we opened up a satellite clinic in Derrick's, and that truly was our first satellite clinic that really was not school-based, not focused on anything, just another family practice clinic. All of our nurse practitioners are board certified, um, eight of them being board certified in family practice, and then one of them board certified psychiatric. We have an active patient base of about 11,000 patients. And so with that, um, and by by active, I mean, this is a two-year look back for us. So if I look, book, look back two years over the patients that we've seen, we touch approximately 11,000 people. Um, we have an after hours triage service. So if you call my clinic at 701, um, you are going to get my staff. You're, it's going to roll over. You're going to talk to one of my, you're either going to talk to one of my medical doctors or you're going to talk to one of my nurse practitioners. They all have the ability to access um, your chart and things that are going on with you from home. And they're there to help you make a good decision, a good decision about whether or not to go to the ER or whether or not to just wait until seven o'clock the next morning and just come in and be seen. And so um, the, the other thing that we do is we do have some emergency after hours stuff. We, we're very rural. Um, and so a lot of times if we have someone that has a four-wheeler accident or things along those nature, then we'll meet them up at the clinic and handle different emergencies. We were without a hospital from 2000 and probably 18 until our, our new hospital just opened in January of this year. And so as you can imagine, um, a lot of emergencies, a lot of after hours, a lot of just on-call stuff. Stuff. And so, but our big goal is we do not want to outsource anything. All of our stuff is handled internally by our providers. Next slide, Justin. And I want to talk about um, our, our firm belief is that quality team-based health care has to be delivered to the right person by the right person at the right place and at the right time every time. If you're not meeting that patient where they're at when they need you, that's not the right place. Um, and so we're a very open access clinic. We don't really like, um, if, you, if you walk into our office or you call our office, odds are we're going to see you the same day. About 65% of our practice um, walks in and is seen the same day because you don't want to come into our practice or you don't want to call a practice and say, I really need an appointment today and be told, well, I'm sorry, the first the first available we have is in a week. The first available we have is in two weeks. Well, we only do wellness visits on this day. That's really not meeting that patient where they're at. And, and to me, that's a big part of social determinants of health. You have folks that have issues with transportation. They have issues um, with food insecurities, you know, finances and what have you. And so it's really important to meet them where they're at. Um, we're a multi-specialty clinic. Our goal is absolutely to do it all. Um, we want to take care of our patients in their own community. We know that as we start to move outside of our practice walls, um, that there's going to be a time barrier there for patients. There's going to be probably a little bit more bureaucracy that we have to deal with, as well as that the patient has to deal with. And so um, we just know that that just just the fact that you're moving outside of our walls is sometimes a stumbling block for patients um, because again you're dealing with transportation issues or you may have a patient who's elderly that can only go to that re referral appointment when his daughter can take off of work and so there's just barriers and we understand that as you start to move away um, our goal is to do it all. So uh, we want we want to take care of all of our patients. We're family practice. We are patient-centered medical home with Medicaid and Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And so our goal is we want to look at that patient in totality and manage everything. Next slide, Justin. So I, I, you've learned about our clinic. Let me give you just a little bit of information about our demographics. So um, our again, our main office is located in Dequeen, Arkansas. So I'm going to give you severe county demographics. 
Um, our current population or what the um, recent census has us at is 15-6 with 55% being white, 4% black, 34% Hispanic. Um, I'm gonna stop at that point and just let you know as well. I'm sure a lot of you guys, our census is not appropriate. It doesn't really match what's going on in our community. Um, I, I sit on county government. And so we actually have our county population at probably closer to 25,000. Um, our current city census has us at around six. I'm going to tell you that's probably closer to 10,000. Um, I would guess that our Hispanic population is probably greater than 52 to 55%. And that's just because of some of the information and some of the stuff that we deal with on the school-based side. Um, I would say probably on the undocumented side, um, I would say of that 25,000, we probably have at least 5,000 um, that are undocumented. And then um, we have a very big Marshallese population of probably over 300. And so we're a very, um, we're, we're a big melting pot. So we're, we're very diverse on um, our population. And so again, you can imagine meeting that patient at the right place at the right time becomes very important. So our economic factors, uh, the median household threshold uh, we think is about 49,000 according, according to our demographics. Um, we have an 18% poverty rate, 15% uh, food insecurity, 17% uninsured, and 5% that have no transportation. Um, I'll tag another thing. I also sat on the housing committee. And so I'll tell you that um, on the housing side, we're also very, very short housing. Um, if you if you look at some of the numbers, we know a very conservative guess is we're short about a thousand homes. I would tell you that's probably closer to 3000 homes. So we have a ton of things that we're working on and dealing with. Uh, next slide, Justin. So we're a huge proponent of team-based care. Um, there is no way for one provider to do all of this work. Um, there is no way for one provider to treat everything about a patient and understand everything that's going on with a patient. It absolutely takes a team. Um, we would not be where we're at today if it were not for our team. Um, you know, people like to say that it takes a village. I'm going to tell you that it absolutely takes everybody in our practice to take care of a patient. And that's from the front office all the way back to the back office. It, it takes everybody. Next slide, Justin. So a little bit about what you're seeing is I done a PowerPoint um, earlier last week about driving innovation um, for the Arkansas Rural Hospital Association. So you cannot talk about driving innovation without dealing with social determinants of health. There's just absolutely no way to do it. You, you can't that's probably one of the biggest driving forces in innovation is how to tackle those social determinants because they affect everything. They're, they're across all spans, all ages. Um, it, they're everywhere. And so one of the ways that, that we really try to stay on top of things is we just we want to be in every program. So we sign up for everything. So, and I would encourage you to do the same. If you're a family practice, if you're behavioral health or what have you, you want to be involved with these programs that are coming up and these pilot projects and things along that nature. And the reason why is, um, Healthcare is changing. It, it's changing very rapidly. It was, to me, before COVID, it was a very slow progression. Um, we were making some changes, some some strides. It wasn't near quick enough for our rule setting. Um, but once COVID hit, that really escalated. It really pushed a lot of services that you would have gotten in the hospital back into family practice. And so we really had to figure out um, how to manage and deal with those things so that our patients had great access to care. Um, the other thing I'm going to tell you is don't be afraid to tag into resources. You have a ton of resources within your area. Um, you have a ton of associations that are there with education and information. Um, you've, you've got Arkansas Foundation for Medical Care. You've got your Arkansas Medicaid rep, your Blue Cross and Blue Shield reps. Um, Justin Valines at SHARE. I mean, again, SHARE was another huge thing that I think um, helped us 
during COVID and, and helps us to this day where we're managing those patients that are having those adverse events. Um, but for us, um, we, and, and I like to tell a little bit of a story on Dr. Walker, and I'm sure he's rolling his eyes right now if he's on this phone call, but um, it started for us about 15 years ago. We decided, I, I was bored with healthcare. I mean, we were seeing our patients, everything was fine. We were Monday through Friday, nine to five, everybody took an hour lunch, didn't really think about social determinants of health, really never thought about um, how healthcare imp impacted our patients. It was more important that we were scheduling at times that were appropriate for us. Um, and we joined into a pilot program. I think um, AFMC was the, the first one that said, you really need to get into this program. And it was called the Arkansas Chronic Illness Collaborative, and we picked up for diabetes. And so um, I was telling Dr. Walker about it, super excited. And he was like, no, 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 you know, we're, we're fine. We've only got about 50 diabetics. They're absolutely all in control. You know, there's, there's nothing for us to improve on. And so I thought, well, you know what, I'm just going to run those numbers. You know, I'm just going to, just to satisfy my own curiosity, which also probably sparked my absolute um, addiction to data. Um, I ran the numbers. And so I went back into his office and I said, okay, do you want me to tell you how bad you suck right now? Or do you want me to save it for when you're on stage? And he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, you don't have 50 diabetics you have 250 and over 50% of them have an A1C that's greater than nine. And he said, no, that can't be because they're telling me they're in control. And I said, well, it, it is. And so that really sparked everything for us that, you know, you had to be, you had to dig and look for that information. And thankfully we had an EMR that could give us that information. And so at that point, I just kind of started walking around the clinic and started doubting everything. I started, you know, running, you know, I, I went into the waiting room and looked at what my patient education was and was shocked. Um, the patient education was all about OB and delivering babies. And we didn't do that but it was in our in our waiting room because it was free. Okay, so that had to change. Um, I then started thinking about, well, wait a minute. Um, how do, how do you prescribe diabetic medication? Well, when the patient comes in and tells me they're in control, I go ahead and run some labs and I write them six worth worth six, six months to a year right there of medications. And then I receive their labs in two to three days. Okay. Well, how, how is that impactful? I mean, you're writing a prescription based on a number that you don't know. Um, you know, how can you manage a patient like that? And so that again, um, was huge expansion for us where we were adding in different machines and just doing things a completely different way. And so kind of our five pillars and, and they're there on your left um, started with ACIC, but kind of developed and honed in as we moved into CPCI, CPC plus, and then of course the last one, primary care first. But for us, we're looking at five driving factors every time we're looking and thinking about what we're going to do for our clinic. Um, we're looking at access and continuity. We're looking at care management. Um, we're looking at comprehensiveness and coordination, not just for the patient, but for our entire medical neighborhood. We want to do patient and caregiver engagement. And then we want to do planned care. We want that care to be very um, population driven um, and reflective of um, good outcomes and, and good things that need to be done on behalf of the patient. And so next slide, Justin. And again, I'll tell you, like uh, Dr. Walker's biggest motto is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so um, we try to be very personable with our patients and very involved in our care, not just because they're our patients, but they're also our neighbors. Um, we go to church with them. We go to school with them. You know, we go out to eat with them. And so it's extremely important that we're involved. And so just to kind of and, and I'm going to visit social determinants of health as we're talking about these functions. Um, but access and continuity, you know, you heard me talk about how important it is to have open access. And that's not just letting patients walk in and make an appointment whenever they want and see, provide, see whichever provider they want. That has to also do with alternatives to office visits. Not everyone has a vehicle. Um, not everyone that has a vehicle should be driving. Um, not, you know, every patient 
every one modality is not enough for the patient. And so, um, yes, we have expanded hours, but we also do alternatives to our office visits. Um, we have a home visit schedule. We have had a home visit schedule for about 10 years, but we had limited that to Saturdays. Um, we blocked off about a half a day for one provider to do home visits. And so as you can imagine, she was able to get two or three home visits in to see those patients. And what happened was we quickly identified that 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 was not enough. And then, of course, once COVID hit, it really wasn't enough because you had a lot of patients that it was just no longer appropriate for them to have that exposure. Um, you know, we had patients who were paraplegic. We had patients who ha had severe COPD. And so while we had that home visit schedule, again, this is one of those things that I'm telling you, you need to be looking at your practice at all times because things can change at a drop of a dime. And so we were able to identify really quickly that this is a population that's got to be managed differently, um, not only because of social determinants of health, but because of also public health emergencies. And so we do home visits, telehealth. Telehealth was has been there for a while but it truly did not become impactful and accessible until the public health emergency. The restrictions were way too onerous, um, way too hard to understand, and it was just not easy, and therefore it, no one was willing to do it. Um, not only were providers not willing to do it, but really patients weren't willing to do it either. Um, those hard clunky platforms to try to dial into so that you're being secure. I mean, those things were just, it was too much for, um, it was a, a lot for an educated population. It was absolutely overwhelming for an uneducated population who, who may or may not have spoke the language. And so, um, Telemedicine has been an absolute game changer for rural Arkansas, rural practices, rural patients, and um, we, we really have to fight to keep it the way that it is. Um, I know there's talk about moving it back to those platforms, um, changing and, and bringing those rules and restrictions back in, and I'm just going to tell you that that will be detrimental to rural patients. Um, we also do, I'm going to get off my soapbox now. Um, we also do remote patient monitoring. Um, we had a ton of patients during that COVID time period uh, where we actually assigned a COVID nurse and, you know, once she would make, she would monitor share. And so, you know, as you guys can remember, there was a lot of times that the hospital just wasn't available. They could not talk. They couldn't pick up the phone. It was just slammed. And so um, our our transitional care nurse did a fantastic job in monitoring share and talking to family and making sure family understood what was going on and then absolutely picking that patient up and picking that patient up quickly from the hospital and then managing them so that they didn't have that readmission, but we were able to do a pulse ox um, and different things on them so that we could keep them stable and keep them stable in their home. Uh, we also do what's called e-visits and structured phone calls. So um, the structured phone calls really come into play um, post ER visits and post hospitalizations, but we also have a whole nother department in our clinic that's called care management. And they have patients who, you know, they may not have an ER visit or a hospitalization, but we know um, they're a high risk patient and we just want to kind of keep our arms around that patient. And so um, I've got three ladies that absolutely manage that population and they may do weekly phone calls. They do, may do monthly phone calls, but they try to keep in contact with that patient. We offer 24-7 access to the EH, to the patient's portal. Um, my providers have 24-7 access to the EHR. Again, you heard me already talk about after hours triage. Um, we also do um, a specialty clinic. So we have another um, facility that we purchase and order supplies with by the year. And so it's also set up as a clinic. And we take and identify our highest referral sources, and we try to get them to come in and do a satellite clinic within our community so we have specialty space. Um, we do have a ton of things that we're testing. Um, if you've ever been to our practice, we have a huge uh, meeting room that we've got whiteboards on every, every wall, and it shows you the things that we feel like we're doing well, the things that we're working on, the things that we're not happy with, and the things that we're planning on implementing. Um, next slide, Justin. 
So as we're talking about access and continuity, I'm always going to throw access and continuity ideas at you um, or social determinant of health ideas. So we do, and, and this really started in the middle in COVID as well, you know, us, like everyone was out there trying to make the signs that were on the front of the building, educating our population as to what was going on. And we knew we had to do those in English, Spanish, and Marshallese. And so um, we quickly got those signs up. Of course, we're using Google Translator, um, like everyone else, to try to come up with things, Marshallese especially. And we had a Marshallese patient. As, I, as I'm hanging the sign up, we have a Marshallese patient that's walking up to the the front door and I said hey can, do you mind reading this sign real quick and just telling me if this is appropriate and his response was I understand what you're saying but we don't believe that we don't believe in this and so that in and of itself was a huge eye-opener for me as well because we really had no one that could in his native language explain to him what was going on and so I don't know if that was the reason for I don't believe what's going on because I don't understand it. And so we immediately at that point started trying to locate um, someone to bring in and hire in our office as a Marshallese translator. And that person, you know, not only worked at our front office, but she also went into the exam room with the patient, went through the exam with the patient, and then actually went with the patient to the pharmacy to assist them in picking up prescriptions as well. And so that one was a really big game changer for us as well. And then she actually was available and on call. So if we had someone that popped into the clinic after her shift, we could simply FaceTime her into that meeting. And so all, all materials, anything that you're going to do on behalf of your clinic should be language appropriate. And again, if you, if you don't understand the demographics of your clinic, you really have to start pulling those numbers. And if you don't understand how to pull those numbers, you have several organizations that are available to you that can help you identify what your population looks like. Um, I'm going to tell you also to get with your local employers. Um, they can help you and tell you as well what those languages are that, that they employ so that you can help them manage those as well. Um, Justin, next slide, please. So uh, the next focus for us is going to be care management. And so um, with this one, we have um, an episodic care manager. We have um, two longitudinal care managers. And then we of course have our home visit provider. And then we have a supervisor over that department. So for episodic, um, I'm 45 years old and I break my hip. That's gonna be a very quick relationship that we have. Um, I'm quickly gonna get referrals. I'm gonna have surgery. I'm gonna have physical therapy and then I'm back on the road to recovery. So that's, that's episodic. Um, longitudinal, I'm 85 years old and I break my hip. Now our relationship looks much different. Um, I'm not going to be back to where I was before I broke my hip. I, I'm going to have to. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to have a long-term relationship. I'm going to need some additional care. So um, I don't know if we have any care managers in the room, um, but um, a, a, another thing I like to ask is, you, do you have an idea as to how many patients someone should? manage or a care manager should manage. And what we found is um, we found that probably it's about 75 patients. You know, once you start um, looking into more than 75, that really becomes hard to wrap your fingers around. It now becomes hard to keep a hold of those patients and you start to lose the effectiveness. Uh, let's see. Next slide, Justin. So again, I'm going to give you some more care management ideas. Um, we risk stratify every patient that walks into our office and we risk stratify every time, every time they walk into the office. Um, but it's a two part thing because we really understand that um, it, 
some patients are just not going to pop positive in that care management realm. You know, you're, you're actually as an individual or as a nurse going to be able to make a better decision, or I'm going to go to church with you and I'm going to understand that you just lost your caregiver. And so our group has free autonomy to risk stratify the patient. But if you disagree with how that patient rendered out, then absolutely go back and, and change that number. Now, what we do ask is that if we're going to change that, if that patient is going to, um, if that number is going to be changed on that patient, then please tell us what was going on. Now, I can tell that from the chat that I've got some that, um, you know, Pamela is saying, well, when I was a care manager, the max we could do is 40 if they were highly complex and time intensive. And I would agree with that. Um, and then Rebecca says, well, we were expected to manage around 150. And, and that's why I would say it's extremely important to separate it out. You are going to have those patients that are fast and furious and episodic and they're moving on. And you're going to have a nurse that really likes working with that population. And then you're going to have or, or what we found in our office was now I have two other nurses who both have backgrounds. One has a background in home health. One has a background in nursing home. And they prefer that older patient, which we know with that age is going to come with more comorbidities, more time intensive more highly complex. And so you really have to figure out, it, there is no one cookie cutter way of how to do it. Um, we just kind of looked at if we had a mixture of these patients, where would that best number be? But ours does split out as well. Um, and I can tell you, it, it changes day by day. So one of the things we do um, require is if our patients are in a high risk registry, which is how we manage them, then um, at least once a year, we want our care managers to go into the home. And the reason why we do that is that patient, we see that patient for 15 to 20 minutes in the office, and we can be having those conversations about, hey, your blood sugars are not where they need to be hey, you, you're going to have to start doing your insulin better. You're going to have to start doing this better and that better. But what we've found is when you go into the home and you identify that a patient doesn't have running water, um, it, it makes that conversation with that patient silly. Um, if, if you have a patient who has no running water, no electricity, and you're screaming at them about insulin, they really have bigger problems problems. Um, they really have other things that they are trying to manage. They're, they're trying to make it through the day. Um, and we've run into that. We, we've had a patient in the past that did not have a refrigerator and was a, a very um, raging diabetic. I mean, it's how can you manage insulin if you don't have a refrigerator? How can you manage food? How can you make decisions about what you're going to eat when you truly don't have a refrigerator? Um, same thing, we had a patient who, you know, was multiple, multiple comorbidities, but once we went into the home, we identified she had no running water. And so um, as the care, it, it, again, I know I've got care managers on the phone. So as the care manager, I'm going to kind of push you guys to start looking at their insurance cards. Um what we found in both cases, one, one of the cases, um, I own rental property, and so I was able to easily come up with an older refrigerator that satisfied the moment and was able to move forward with it. Um, but what we found on the other one and on several that we've had that have had no transportation is the back of the insurance card actually has information about transportation and other things. And once we made that phone call to the insurance company and said, hey, you guys are harping on us to make sure this patient gets a pap smear, a mammo, and certain items done, but this patient has no running water. And so on a couple of occasions, the insurance carrier has actually sent someone down to resolve that situation. Because again, they're technically in value-based programs as well. You know, you may be dealing with United Healthcare, but United Healthcare also picks up a majority of their funds from the federal government, and the federal government says you have to meet certain metrics, you have to have certain documentation. Well, if that patient is is not getting appropriate documentation or is not meeting appropriate measures, they lose money as well. And so, again, as the care manager, I'm going to just say, flip the back of their insurance card and make a couple of phone calls. You can start to get yourself help on those situations. 
Um, same thing with transportation. So I'll kind of touch on transportation just a little bit. And Justin, you're going to have to keep me on track for time schedule. Um, but on the transportation side, um, Stark, Stark restrictions lifted just a little bit about five years ago. And so what we found was we had the ability to offer transportation for our patients, but we are not permitted to advertise it, nor are we permitted to um, solicit patients with it. And so when we first started talking about it, I was in another chat group and they were like, oh, that's horrific. You can't do that. Think about all the liability that's going to happen. And so um, we, we thought about that. I thought about that for days, um, called my insurance carrier and said, hey, I've got one vehicle that I want to identify that could potentially transport patients. Um, it's not our goal to transport a patient, but in certain instances, we may have to do that. And so they were able to adjust the insurance. The insurance premium on that vehicle went up $1,000 a year, which yes, that's horrific, but I'm going to compare it to a couple of things for you in just a second. So it increased by 1000 dollars a year. Um, and we were able to um, identify a healthcare attorney who got a waiver for us or created a waiver for us so that the patient that rides in this vehicle signs a waiver. That patient is only given a ride from their home to our office and pharmacy and back home again. And so what happened with that was um, we had a couple of patients that were new to the area, um, moved into a smaller community next to us. They were needing six-month refills. We had already done a couple of extensions on them. And at this point, my providers were like, no, I cannot refill that medicine again unless you've had labs. They, their only means of transportation had broken down. And so we talked to them a little bit because the first thing my care management group does is they really try to use another service. Do you qualify for the Medicaid ban? No. Um, where, who's your church family? Because a lot of times your churches will handle transportation as well. And these folks just simply did not meet. They, we, there was no external resource that we had for them. And so um, their solution was they were just going to call the ambulance and go to the ER and get six month refills. Okay, well, we know that that ambulance ride is $500 to $1,500 a piece. We know that that ER visit is going to be at least $3,000. Uh, we know that that's not an appropriate place for long-term care. And so based on that, it was very easy for us to say, again, we're in value-based programs. So we know that that expenditure is coming eventually out of our pocket. And so the decision to pay for that vehicle was a very quick one. It was like, yes, we have to do this. Now, again, I'll tell you that we don't advertise it. We don't, we don't want to do it, but we also know that you're going to have those situations in which it just becomes, and you have to handle that. Um, the same thing with the Medicaid ban. You know, we all know we have to have three days to schedule that. Well, there are times when there's an absolute emergency and there's no way to do that. Um, we have wound care issues where we need to be able to see that patient on a daily basis. And maybe the home visit provider can catch them one day, but because of workload, she can't catch them the next. And so for our care management group, they each have vehicles and they have an iPad. So they can go into the home, check and make sure that things are going okay. And they have the ability to telehealth back with our provider should they need to do that. So again, I want you to be thinking about the whole focus of this is you are meeting the patient where the patient is, not where you are. You, you have to meet them at their right time, at their right place for this to be impactful. Now, I will tell you, um, these are some examples. So we also do um, what's called our resources resource brochure. So for our resource brochure, what we look at is um, utilities, um, food, housing, child care, health care, mental health services. What and everyone's like this. You always everyone always has this one nurse in the office that absolutely knew everything about every service everywhere that was available for a patient. Ours with Heather. But inevitably, you get that one patient in the clinic on the day that Heather's not there. And so what we decided to do was create a resource guide. And with that resource guide, we now train all of our nurses to almost be that social worker. Um, 
we have a health risk assessment that we're going to do on our patient. It makes up about 15 questions. Those 15 questions talk about utilities. They talk about food. They talk about your church home. They talk about transportation. And if we have any patients that pop positive on that screener, we immediately pull out that health resource guide and show them where they can find that information. We have an internal food bank. Um, so we know that we can we can show them, number one, we can get you a, a sack of food today, but we can also look at where are you going to get food the next time. And so one of the things that happened to us was we really truly didn't start looking at other languages until about a year ago. And again, it was one of those things. My nurses are trying to have a conversation with a patient in that who is Marshallese about where to go get food. Well, you can hand them that English document, but it, it is absolutely not impactful. And so it was then that we decided to go ahead and translate that into Spanish and also Marshallese. Um, it's an internal document that we produce. Um, it, we print them as needed. We keep them at DHS. We keep them at the jail. We keep them at um, the courthouse, pretty much any organization that wants access to our resource guide, we print up 50 of them in each language and bring it to them. Um, we're able to quickly make changes as people leave different organizations. You know, if the utilities assistance number changes, then we're gonna update that as needed. And, and then we do a major overhaul of it where we review it in December for accuracies and we, we do a, a brand new one every January. So this one has really, um, really been impactful for us as far as handling this. And I want to go back to our um, health screener, our social determinant of health screener. That was a program in which we decided to partner with um, Arkansas Children's Hospital. Um, Medicaid come in and said, hey, they've got this new pilot at Children's Hospital. We would love for you guys to join in with them. They would like for you to do a screener on um, kids that are 12 and under, and you're specifically looking at utilities, housing, and food, and children's will make sure that you have food pantry bags here so that you can pass those out. So I came back to my group, and we're talking about it. And one of my nurses said, well, wait a minute, why wouldn't we do this for everyone? And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, yeah, why, why wouldn't I do this for everyone? And so um, I quickly told them, hey, I, you know, I appreciate the idea for the bags. We don't need them. We'll partner with our local church um, because they're doing a food pantry already. And so we'll just handle things that way. And then we immediately loaded it into our system so that we screen everyone. Now, I can tell you that it probably wasn't a year. And I thought to myself, OK, we're doing a lot of coordination with the church. I mean, it's a very good partner for us, but I'm having to call someone in sometimes when I'm quickly running out of bags and someone's having to take time out of their day, their Saturday or what have you to come up, load bags and bring those to me, why wouldn't we just manage this internally? And so I'll kind of visit a little bit along that as we continue to move forward. But again, you're constantly thinking about what's the best thing for my patients in my clinic? Um, what what social determinants are impacting their health care? What are things that are holding them back? And so again, I just want to throw you out some care management ideas. Um, look at, um, and, and you've got to look at the mental health side of it too, but look at how you can help those patients when you're not around. Because remember, 80% of their health care is outside of your walls. It's outside of a hospital. It's outside of anything that you're you're doing. And so you've got to educate that patient just past your four walls. Uh, next slide, Justin. And I think I'm gonna have to speed up because I'm not gonna make it. So um, another one for us is comprehensiveness and coordination. And so um, three years ago, I believe it was three years ago, um, my husband said, what do you want for your birthday? And I said, I want a school-based health clinic. And he said, no, really, what do you want? And I said, no, that's really what I want. Um, and so we were lucky enough that our school district thought it was an excellent idea too. Um, we are not grant funded or grant supported. We are a private um, 
privately funded school-based clinic. Um, and I can tell you that the idea that children can walk into our office there in kindergarten and have the exact same healthcare system all the way through graduation um, gives me goosebumps every time that I say it. Um, if it doesn't give you goosebumps, you're, you're just not human. Um, because that's not a normal thing for kids. Um, again, you know, as you start to think about social determinants of health, you have to think about longevity, about continuity. You know, every time that individual, and not just a kid, is bounced around from one provider to the next, there is a social, there, there is a determinant there. Maybe not a social determinant, but there is a barrier to healthcare. You know, you're having to relearn that patient every time you see them. You're having to think about, them and go back and try to figure out everything that's going on with them, where these kids actually have the ability to just see the same provider, see the same health system the whole way through. So anyway, I love my school-based clinic. Um, I think it's a very good um, partnership. What we wanted to do was immediately track um, absenteeism. We wanted to, we had a baseline for what that looked like, and then we wanted to make sure that we were able to show a reduction in that. Now, what I can tell you happened is COVID happened, <laughs> and so that really just blew that out of the water, but we were able to step in quickly with the district and say, you know, let us do your contact tracing, let us handle, you know, your school nurses, if you've never sat down and visited with a school nurse, they really manage a lot of things tube feedings, medication, I mean, a lot of high level things. And so anything that we can take off of them and help with, we're going to do that. Whether that's, you know, checking for head lice or screening vision or what have you, anything we can reduce off of them is a good day for them. And so um, I think we have a really good relationship, a good partnership. I can tell you that we um, most recently started doing um, mental health services two days a month at the school. And so we have a full-time on-site um, psychiatric nurse practitioner. And she said, again, I want to meet my kids where they're at. You know, a lot of times, you know, she's, she's a 10 hour day, four days a week. And so we try to make sure we have enough time for parents to get her. But she said, you know, if I can come in on the school-based side two Fridays a month and see the kids, then I'm reducing the, the parents need to take off from work. But I also get to see the kids in their own environment. And so um, actually it's the third Friday of every month, I'm sorry. And so we've been doing that for quite some time and that's worked really well for us. So just her being able to, to see those kids where they're at. Um, the next slide, Justin. We do have issues. So a lot of times um, we may see a child in the clinic that um, we're trying to identify um, next steps and what to do. And, you know, anytime you have a very nomadic population, you run into the risk of I really need this kid back. Like, I really need to talk to this parent. I really need to figure out what we're going to do. And the same thing on the school side. There are times when the school sees a patient or sees a child and they're like, I really, I really need someone to look at this patient. I really need someone to lay eyes on this patient. And so we have a very good relationship with the school district in which, you know, there are times when we're laying eyes on a patient and we're just, it, we're doing it free. I mean, it's it's just something where it's what needs to happen for that child. And so um, I like to think that we kind of battle our social determinants of health together. Um, we also partner with them and um, help handle their food banks. Um, and we do that at a couple of different schools. And so, you know, just some kind of ideas where you can jump out there and be looking at different things is, you know, we're going to do, um, we're going to try our best to do the free physicals for as many of our districts as we can. Um, just because that's a huge thing to get accomplished. You know, kids have to have a physical to do sports. Sometimes parents don't have transportation, but we know that if we can get those kids involved in sports, it reduces, um, it sometimes keeps them on the right path. And so we want to be available for that. Um, we do immunization uh, clinics at the school districts doing not just a queen, but registrations and on anytime we're on site, we're bringing immunizations. Um, and I can tell you, so la a couple of months ago, we were able to go to the school district or school board and inform them that 98% of the children on the DeQueen campus um, were all up to date on immunizations. And I don't know if you guys have ever again, talked to a school nurse where you're dealing with kids that are past due, but 
to hit 98% um, was absolutely phenomenal. Um, and what we found was the other 2% were not full time students. They were either homeschooling or they were only on site for different services. And so that was a huge win for us. Um, next slide, please. So again, I'm going to, patient and caregiver engagement is a must. You know, you have got to have patient and caregiver engagement, or this is simply not going to work. Um, we have a patient advisory board. Our patient advisory board um, helps us to look at um, what's going right in the clinic, what's going wrong, and what needs to happen in the clinic. Are there services that we need to bring on? And we try to use stakeholders um, in the community, you know, someone from the hospital, someone from home health, someone from the school district who can kind of help us navigate and make decisions about things that we need to do. Next slide, Justin. And so again, patient engagement ideas, you know, I'm constantly putting on, you know, this, these are my team members, these are my employees, um, you know, we'll do a drive up flu clinic, we, we try to partner as much as we can with as many organizations as we can, especially right now when you are dealing with a lot of um, employee turnover, you know, there's organizations that are having problems getting enough staff to man a flu clinic or getting enough staff to do different things. And so with my group, um, we're all about community outreach. We're all about, you know, how can we partner with these other facilities and do things that need to be done? And so, um, you know, you've got to have those patient engagement, but I'm going to say community engagement as well. Uh, next slide, Justin. So one of the things that you really need to ask yourself as you're moving forward is, Look at your patients in totalities. You know, what are your big care gaps, but what are your clinic gaps? You know, what are you looking at that um, is a gap between you and the patient? You know, what social determinant of health screener um, do you have your patients handling or doing with with the patient or your employees. And then I'm gonna also caution you, don't ever ask a question that you can't answer. Um, I could not imagine looking at someone and saying, are you having a food insecurity today? And they say, yes, and I just rock on to the next question. I mean, you, you, whatever questions you're going to ask, you need to be ready to answer those. Next slide. Uh, and then study what you're doing, you know, study the things that you're doing, be consistent in how you're meeting, be consistent in how that education gets to the rest of your staff. Um, because you can do a ton of things, but if you're not, if everyone's not aware of what you're doing, then, then that is meaning, meaning it has no meaning whatsoever. Um, we like to joke in our office that you really have to be an employee for at least two years, or we absolutely think that you're a newbie because you, there's no way that you can understand everything that we're doing in our practice. Um, next slide, Justin. So, uh, and these are a couple of things that are very dear to me. So I'm going to, one of the things that we're focusing on and honing in on right now is um, for a social determinant of health, I think that location of services is big. Um, a transportation barrier is also a barrier to health care. Um, they're going to lead to missed appointments, rescheduled appointments, delayed care, delayed medication. You know, those consequences lead to uh, poor management of chronic disease, i.e. poor outcomes. Um, you know, transportation is an absolute basic necessity for ongoing health care, um, especially for those patients who have comorbidities and chronic disease. Those, those patients with chronic disease absolutely have to have clinical visit, medication access, medication changes, changes. Their changes to their treatment plans can happen on a dime, and that is very hard to do if you don't have it's hard to do with a homebound schedule. It's impossible to do if the patient doesn't have transportation or at least an additional caregiver. Um, I'm going to give you just a little bit of, of background on Derek's clinic. And so uh, we initially opened this clinic in 2020. Or, or no, excuse me, excuse me. So I pulled data for Derek's clinic and what I wanted to see was how many patients did I, how many patients did I have living in that community that I had seen in my practice? Ran the number, I had 267 patients that had been in the clinic in 2020. 
In March of 21, we opened the practice over there. Now, this is a very small practice. It's one exam room. Um, it, for a long time, it was just the nurse and the provider. The nurse handled everything from check-in to check-out. Um, and so in March of 21 through the end of December, we saw 363 patients. In 2022, we saw 551 patients. I will tell you that as of April the 15th of this year, we've seen 418 patients in that clinic. And so, again, I want to hone in on transportation. Patients, if they can, will drive, but not all the time. You know, even if they have transportation, just the fact that you're not in their community starts to become somewhat of a barrier. And so I'm really excited about this clinic because we actually just bought the building next door to it um, and are adding three three additional exam rooms and x-ray. And so those things are happening this year. But again, they're they're happening based on data. They're happening based on watching the numbers and seeing what's happening. Um, Next slide, Justin. Another thing that our office has recently done is, you know, we've always had our food pantry. We've always had our food pantry bag, or we've had it for at least for the last three to five years. Um, We've went ahead and started a 5013C called Feed Local. Um, With Feed Local, it is very much geared to the kids in the school district. Right now, we 100% 100 fund the Derrick's Food Pantry at the Derrick School System. Um, We offset as needed for the DeQueen Health, the DeQueen District um, Food Pantry. And then we're trying to identify a way that we can pick up and start to help with the Horatio Food Pantry. Um, I don't know if you guys can kind of see what's in that bag. There's usually about eight to 15 items in that bag. And what we've identified is that bag cost us approximately $10. Not the bag, but the, the, the bag and the food in it is about $10. Um, that's going to be about three, about two to three days worth of food. And so what happens is once you're positive in our office for a food insecurity, we're going to hand you that bag of food, but we're also going to give you that resource guide and tell you where you can start to identify other places to receive food. Um, just some kind of statistics is, you know, 82% of Arkansas counties have one or more communities that need improved food access. And that's not just need food, but when you're in a rural setting, sometimes your closest grocery store is the dollar store. Um, And again, while that is food, that isn't healthy food. It it isn't going to be a long-term Term solution. And so I think we have to really start um, getting into these things and identifying what are we going to do about this? And, and this was a biggie one for, for Dr. Walker too. When I said I want an in-office food bank, he was like, my God, you're going to bankrupt us. <laughs> And so I I keep an eye on what's going on with the food pantry just for him. Um, And so I can tell you that in the last probably three years, we've given away about 75 bags. So it's really not bad. Um, It was 75 bags that needed to be given. Um, It was 75 bags that made a difference in someone's life. And that translated to about $750. Now, if that reduced an ER visit because someone went to the ER because they were hungry, then in a value-based system, I'm a win. You know, I'm I'm handling that every time. Um, And so, you know, again, the other thing you want to kind of touch on just a little bit is employee burnout. Um, I I feel like we don't have a lot of burnout, or if we do, it really takes a while for us to reach that situation, just because our employees have a lot of tools in their tool belt. You know, they can, they're not looking at that child and saying, I'm sorry, you have a food insecurity. There's nothing I can do about it. They're not looking at that patient or talking to that patient on the phone who says, I have no transportation. Um, We are able to mitigate some of those things. And let's face it, most people went to went to nursing or went to medical school because they wanted to help people. And so to me, the more I can help my employees help people, the better their satisfaction is in their job and what they're doing. And so, um, again, you know, I, let me get off my um, platform. Uh, next slide, Justin. So, again, and, and I'm just going to kind of probably run through the last three 
couple of them. Um, you really need to make sure you're looking at health equity when you're driving innovation or when you're looking at social determinants of health. Um, you know, you, you're dealing with, um, we know that under health equity, um, these underserved communities are going to be low income, rural, low health literacy, uh, people of color, immigrants, people with disabilities, older patients, underinsured. Um, and so you really want to figure out how am I going to meet those patients where they're at? How am I going to be impactful? How am I going to start mitigating those social determinants of health? Uh, next slide. So, and again, I just want to focus you on, you know, and if you, again, if you're in a value-based system, this starts to really hurt you because without health equity, you're looking at illness severity, you're looking at higher medical cost, um, lack of access, lack of treatment, um, higher rates of disease and higher mortality rates. Um, you know, think about, um, and, and again, I go back to telehealth, you know, you think about your population when that barrier to telehealth was removed, you know, how many patients did you, I mean, I can tell you this, before telehealth, we might've done five a year. Um, once they removed that barrier and patients could meet you where they were at on the platform that they were at, um, it immediately increased their access to healthcare. And so to me, you have a huge population of patients that suddenly accessed healthcare that probably had never accessed it before. And so, you know, again, I think we have to think about those things as we start to come out of this public health emergency and make changes. Um, next slide. So you heard me talk about um, Derek's clinic, the things that are coming soon. And so um, if any of my employees are on the phone, surprise, um, you know, we're expanding Derek's clinic. Um, we're lo also looking at um, doing a mobile vaccination clinic and not just a mobile vaccination clinic, but a mobile um, physicals clinic, as well as vision screener clinic to help out our districts. You know, this would allow us to come into the different school districts or different areas and help those kids get those physicals, get those vision screenings and make sure that they're up to date on immunizations. Um, we've also recently started a partnership with um, uh, Right Rhythm Monitors. With that partnership, um, there are there are times when my providers would like to put a halter monitor or an event monitor on a patient so that they could identify what's going on or there, there's something going on and they can't figure out what that is. What happens now is we make a referral. So we make a referral to the cardiologist um, that hopefully that appointment's in two to three weeks. That patient now drives a minimum of 52 miles to see the cardiologist unless they're in our specialty clinic. Um, and then they see the cardiologist and the cardiologist decides, well, I want an event monitor or I want a Holter monitor. And you're gonna wear this for two weeks and then you're gonna come back. So with this partnership, we will now actually have these monitors within our clinic. Um, when my providers see a patient that they think this is this patient has a cardiac issue, I can't put my finger on it, but something they're going to go ahead and make the referral for um, the cardiologist and they're going to go ahead and order the halter or the event monitor and my, our department, our lab department is going to place it that way. Now that patient has data right now so that when they show up at that appointment in two weeks, now that that cardiologist has data right now. And so what we've identified is we really think that we've shaved about four weeks of, the, of time um, and numbers of miles off the patient so that when they have that first visit, that's an impactful visit for that patient. That's a, that's a visit in where it's not necessarily just a consult, but now that patient's receiving treatment. And so I think you, you know, look at things like that within to see is, is there anything I can do for my patient that reduces the time, reduces the trans, reduces time away from work, time for a caregiver to have to take off work to take mom or dad, but also mileage and transportation for that patient that they may or may not have. Next slide. And I'm going to end with, um, you know, remember that the population, your population really stands to benefit greatly from your services, whatever those services may be. Um, and you, so you want to be impactful to your patients. You know, we do have a responsibility to make sure that we're not leaving them behind. Um, and 
and again, I know you guys, everyone sees this across every spectrum, but you know, my heart is always going to be in rural healthcare. And so I can tell you that this is no more, this is to me more impactful in a rural setting. You know, the, these are folks that do not live in a populace. So they're already potentially behind on things that are available. You know, they're, they have to make a very, um, very moving um, to get somewhere. You know, they, they have to really put thought and time and money and energy to get to appointments, to go to specialties, to get services performed. And so the more that we can bring those back into that rural setting, the more we are removing those barriers and we're increasing that access. And so to me, I mean, we've got to look at better care, smarter spending so that we can, so that that can result in healthier people. And that's it. Did I did I make it on time, Justin? Oh, five, uh, minutes. five minutes over. You're good. <laughs> Kim, we'll turn it back over to you, Angie. That was amazing. Oh, thanks, Justin. Absolutely. Wow. Let me just say, I am so inspired. Um, what a resource to your community thinking outside the box, all the different services, the multiple languages. This is absolutely phenomenal, and, and what, a, what a model for us to, to see of when we think outside the box and we pull resources together, what can really happen. Um, I know it is 835, so I want to thank everyone for spending our morning with us. Um, thank you as well, Ms. Walker. This was fantastic, and I absolutely um, can't wait. I'm going to re-watch this to get some ideas. I uh, hope everyone has a wonderful day. And with that, we'll close this out. This will be um, on our website. So you'll be able to refer back to it to get some ideas um, for programs in your communities. Thanks again. Thank you.